Welcome back to M.L. Miller Frights, part of the Kings of Horror Network. I'm M.L. Miller. I know it hasn't been long since the last one, but I've got another low-budget binge for you. And once again, I've tweaked that logo up there. I think it's looking keener by the week. On with the indie and low-budget reviews. Aqua Slash is not going to be everyone's cup of joe, but for me it was a fun mix of slasher films and something I avoided like the plague as a kid, water parks. Given my pale complexion, all forms of water fun scared me as a kid. As a true ghoulish hermit, I would much rather avoid the sun's rays and be under an umbrella reading comic books than out in the ocean filled with sharks, alligators, jellyfish, and humanoids from the deep. That fear of water parks isn't really addressed in Aqua Slash, Instead, we get to witness a plethora of love triangles, which makes you trust no one when one of them sets out to cause mass chaos and murder at the local water park. Fitting one of the slides with razor blades and murdering a few others, the killer isn't the most charismatic, but still, the unique locale of the murders and the weird vibe of this film makes Aqua Slash a very unique slasher film. This one is from Renaud Gauthier the man who unleashed Disco Path on us a few years ago. Only his second film, Gauthier skips forward to honor the 80s rather than the 70s in his previous film, as the theme of the water park is the raucous 80s. They even play Corey Hart's Sunglasses at Night, so you know it's retro. This is simply a weird little film. People don't really act like normal people, no one has a relationship that isn't messily tied into someone else's. The kills are few and far between, and the pace is all over the place. As after the first kill, in the first few moments, there really isn't anything but relationship stuff going on for the next 45 minutes. That is until we get to the violent and ultra-gory climax with the rigged-up bladed water slide. That's when Aqua Slash kicks into gear and bodies start flying, sliding, and bobbing around in the bloody water. Once the insanity starts, it doesn't end. Does it make any sense? Not a whole hell of a lot, but I had a fun with this nonsensical oddity. I'm not saying Aqua Slash is great, but I did have fun with it, and Gauthier proves to be an unconventional director to watch out for. Aqua Slash is on demand and digital download from Blue Fox Entertainment. Shudder unleashed Yummy last week, and it's quite a delicious treat from Belgium. A gal with big, big boobs decides to get them reduced. Her nebbish boyfriend tells her that he will love her no matter what size her big, big boobs are. When they go to a seedy plastic surgeon clinic for cheap reduction with their highly plasticized mother-in-law in tow, it turns out that someone in the clinic has been infected with a zombie virus. You know what that means. Plastic Surgery Nightmare Zombies Yummy is a wonderful, energetic, and twisted little zombie film that's got all kinds of warped takes on plastic surgery like botched boob jobs, faulty penis implants, and gooey liposuction catastrophes. On top of that, there's an awesome sense of gallows humor throughout. I also like the fun, moral skew that was going on throughout the whole film, as there's a sort of love triangle between the gal with big, big boobs, her loving but unheroic boyfriend who says the size of her big, big boobs doesn't matter, and a much more masculine male orderly who seems to be obsessed with said big, big boobs. This one definitely reminded me of Shaun of the Dead, as it maintains a darkly comic tone throughout, but occasionally gets deathly serious and is able to knock those scenes out of the park as well. There are some awesome practical effects everywhere and homages to Reanimator and the Living Dead at Manchester Morgue. I know Train to Busan Peninsula is just around the corner, but so far, Yummy is the best time I've had watching a zombie movie this year. I watched The Masked Mutilator on Tubi, but it's also available on demand in digital download. Since I ripped into Wrestle Massacre pretty hard last week, I was hoping for a wrestle horror hybrid worth backing. I don't think appreciators of highbrow cinema will find much worth to Masked Mutilator, but there is fun to be had with it. 
It seems most of the film was made in the 90s, and the mullets and horrible clothing are pretty indicative of that era. But it looks like the filmmakers went back more recently and filmed some new scenes and fixed some of the plot holes in an attempt to make it all work. The difference in film stock and clothing and everything else is pretty jarring, but it does sort of work. I admire the passion this film has to never give up on the project, no matter how long it has gathered dust bunnies. The story focuses on a house full of foster children who are wards of the state. The house is run by a strict disciplinarian who used to be a professional wrestler until he accidentally killed someone in the ring. When bodies start piling up at the house and foster kids start dying, all roided up and muscular fingers point to the former masked mutilator. While this is a pretty bloodless film, there are gratuitous fight scenes that are cheesier than anything I've seen in ages, and that makes up for the lack of blood. The fact that numerous actors in the film are so swole that they can't even put their arms to their sides makes it all the more into some kind of fascinating train wreck. There's a real sense of care and understanding of what it is like inside a residential facility for foster kids with the cramped surroundings, minimal modes of treatment, high tension, and rampant abuse. And I appreciate that every character really does seem to be fleshed out with real-world issues before they're choked out or pummeled by the mask mutilator, that is. All in all, this is a well-intentioned movie that fits nicely into the so-bad-it's-good category. Are you looking for the thrills and chills of Blumhouse's The Hunt, but aren't interested in all of that social satire and political commentary? Do you need a movie that doesn't require all of that thinking and moral discussion? Well, look no further than American Hunt. This is an ultra-low budgeter about a pair of brothers who lure groups of people to camp out on their vast farmland property, only to don masks, gear up with guns, and hunt them down. There's not a lot more to American Hunt. The performances are passable. They're not great, but they're not terrible. The two killers are decently fleshed out, but they feel like they'd be more at home in a Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie. The momentum keeps moving forward, and the pace is pretty fast. It's a breezily themed time waster, and not much else. I'd recommend it for a lazy afternoon watch. It pales in comparison to the wonderful satire and solid action of Blumhouse's The Hunt, and while American Hunt is a rather soulless ripoff, I didn't go in expecting much, and I didn't get much either. But I'm okay with that. I give this one a mild recommendation. The best this week's low-budget binge has to offer is not really a horror movie at all. Still, Skyman is a wonderful film about UFO obsession from one half of the folks who brought you the Blair Witch Project. Dan Murick's Skyman is a mockumentary that feels amazingly real from beginning to almost the end as Murick's camera follow a UFO believer, Carl Merriweather, played by Michael Sell, who had contact with an alien when he was 10 years old, and with his 40th birthday coming up, he feels the aliens are going to return. Skyman is more like David Lynch's charming The Straight Story than The Blair Witch Project or Lake Mungo, but still, it is ultimately watchable. Cell is fantastic as the genuine, but definitely mentally ill, Carl, who most definitely seems to be on the autism spectrum. He's a genius with machines, but as we learn by following him around, he isn't the most articulate or socially outward of folks. Cell is extremely convincing in this lead role, so much that you feel sorry for him and end up rooting for all of his prepping to re-meet these aliens works out. The camera follows Carl to a UFO convention and then around his day-to-day -day life, preparing a storage crate in the middle of the desert as the spot where the alien contact will occur. Nicolette Sweeney plays Carl's sister, Gina, and really delivers a standout performance as she gives in to Carl's obsessions, providing sisterly ribbings, but still supporting him because she knows how much it means for him. Sweeney's convincing and soulful performance is heartbreaking, and it's another reason some will be fooled that this is a real documentary. UFOs and aliens aside, Skyman is about living with mental illness trying to fit into a world that doesn't feel familiar, and the hope that prompts us all to get out of bed in the morning. 
There really isn't a scare to be had in Skyman, and while we do get an answer to whether the aliens are real or all in Carl's head, the film serves as a quiet little movie about a tragic life. I absolutely love this film, and if you don't go into this one expecting a horror film, I think you'll be surprised as it is laced with all kinds of genre goodness. But at its heart, it's a really simple, elegant, slice-of-life story about a very damaged human being. Skyman is in drive-ins this week and on demand in digital download on July 7th from Gravitas Features. Well, that'll be it for another low-budget binge on ML Miller Frights. If you dug this video, hit like below. Don't forget to share with your friends across social media. Go to mlmillerwrites.com for written reviews. And please, please, please subscribe and hit the bell for notifications so you never miss a video. Thank you so much for watching, and take care. Stuck inside your reality